We are live. Hello. Oh, wait. We're supposed to start like this. Even better. Let's get the real tight. Uh, yes. <laughs> All right. Up close and personal. Hello, hi. How are you? <laughs> good, good. Um, Rivka was with us just a few seconds ago, but now she's having technical issues. So we'll see if she joins us. Uh, we are going to be covering the news. Um, news that Susanna prepared for us. Thank you, Susanna, for preparing oh, the news me. every week. Yes, our Susie, our own Susie. Um, all right, and we have a lot of people in the live chat. Um, we have a celebrity. How is ooh, yes. Here. Yes. Um, How is our audio? Is is our audio the same level like me and Susie? Because I could adjust it if it's not. Uh, so is saying audio is great. Hey, Harris. We and should do guys, a live stream. With her. Yeah, uh, go subscribe to Harris Sultan if you're interested yeah. in Islam issues and Pakistan and India related issues more specifically, and dinosaurs. <laughs> All right, yes, but just like I agree with Harris, can we actually get this started? Oh wait. Uh, no, wait, no, we're not going to get started because Ghost Bunny has an inf important information here for us. It's saying you're both sexy tonight, need more black, though. Oh, you need to. Oh, yeah, you okay, do look sure, sure. In black. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, okay, okay, okay. Um, cool, we have people on Facebook. Okay, hey, Luke is here. Hi, Luke, it's good hey, to see you. Here. Um, I was saying, <laughs> I only made one video on dinosaurs. Okay, no, your channel is about religion, dinosaurs. secularism, India, Pakistan, and dinosaurs forever. Yes, Get forever. That's going to be what your channel is about. It's going to be for dinosaurs. Right. Anyways. Let's get to the news. Um, yes, and our first news is very important. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, um, as you guys are likely aware, um, we have been covering for almost a month the um, arrest of uh, the ex-Muslim secular feminist atheist activist Zara Kay. Um, so, we have another update to bring to you guys. Um, for all the latest updates on Zara's case, please always refer to the Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain. They are the source to go to. Um, so the fifth update is that um, we need the Australian government to step up in their action um, to secure Zara's safety and bring her home. Um, but actually, let me get into the description I wrote. Atheist Republic is reiterating its call upon the Australian government to prioritize and work urgently to ensure the safe return of atheist activist Zara Kay. Zara, the founder of the Australian charity Faithless Hijabi, was detained in Tanzania on trumped up charges on the 28th of December 2020 and held for 32 hours. Since being bailed, Zara has had to report to the police station every single day, every single weekday until the 11th of January. Now she has had to report sporadically. Over in the over three weeks since her initial detainment, there has been no court date or no movement towards a resolution of her case. The continued and unnecessary delays raise serious concerns regarding Zara's safety. The Australian government has a duty to protect its citizens abroad. So here is where I am um, call, uh, making a call to action upon you guys, our audience, and our community. So the call to action is you can help Zara by contacting the Australian authorities and demanding that they step up their advocacy for Zara K. Australian citizens should be able to rely on their government to help them fight judicial harassment when overseas. Um, so in the description where you see all of the news that we're covering today, um, you see on the first news update for Zara K and then it says help Zara and then a link. That link is to the second update that CEMB did on Zara and that second update contains the contact information for Australian authorities in basically every major country. 
so if you, to, to make things easier for you, I provided an easy way to find the way to contact Australian authorities to um, alert them to the urgency of Zara's situation. Um, I have been personally very disappointed in their lack of advocacy for Zara. Um, and a, um, I maybe I'm being too harsh, but what it, it has appeared to me as kind of a hands-off approach, emphasis on appears to me, okay? Um, yeah, they might be doing things beyond the, uh, behind the scene that we don't know, but because we can't know, we're going to um, assume that they're not and then uh, shame them and then say, oh, okay, I guess you were if we are proven otherwise. It's better to assume that what we see is what we get and tell them like, what the hell, Australia? Why are you not doing anything? This is your citizen, uh, mm -hmm. and you're supposed to, as a government, be protecting your citizen. And then, if later we realize that they were doing so much behind the scenes that we don't know, they were like, oh, okay, I guess that's. But we can't just assume that and not push the government uh, right now and tell them like, what is it like? What is the what's the point of like? What is the worth of an Australian citizenship if you can't rely on the government to come and defend you when you're in trouble, right? Like this is so pathetic, embarrassing to every Australian. Every Australian it should really be like, is. every Australian should be like, okay, so what's the, like, is this how my government will protect me? Mm -hmm. um, if, if I'm in trouble and another, like, is this like, every time your citizen is in trouble, this should become an opportunity for your government to demonstrate the value of the citizenship and the how far your, this government will go to protect the people that it's meant to protect. It should become like, make it a, a model, for, a bragging right for future. Like, look at what we have done. Look at what it means to be an Australian citizen or whatever citizen, right? And every time they fail, people, every single citizen of that country should be like, I guess, I guess you guys don't give a crap about it. Like, I guess there's not much value, um, you know, like you could, if you're, for example, an American citizen, you can know like, yeah, my government really comes after anybody who lays a hand on me, right? If mm -hmm. I'm outside mm -hmm. of the country. And I guess you Australians, I guess like you don't get that from your government. I guess your government doesn't care as much as um, uh, for you guys as much as my government does. Like you, that should become something that people brag about and something that people shame their government for if the government doesn't come and protect them when they need them. If you um, want to look at it very strategically, it's an excellent marketing opportunity. For, oh, Hara Sultan here, who is an Australian citizen himself, is saying there is no worth in being an Australian citizen. Dang. Um, dang okay. I don't. I wouldn't say I mean, no worth, but uh, yeah. But <laughs> at this moment, let's just like it's okay to ex right now. We can be okay. upset. We can exaggerate a bit because it's um, right now. We're like, we need to. We need our friend out of Tanzania ASAP. ASAP. Okay. Exactly. Um, and here's the deal, you guys. It's. In five days, she will be have dealing with the situation for a month. There is basically yes, she was it, today is the twenty third. She was arrested on December twenty eighth. Twenty eighth. Wow. It's almost a month of this BS where they still have not levied like hard official charges against her. They're just working to pin something on her. She has to continue to report to the police station now sporadically about once a week. But nothing is moving forward. If they can pin something on her, I believe, okay, I'm no lawyer that you have, according to Tanzanian law, you're supposed to be charged within 48 hours. I could be wrong. Don't quote me on that. But that's my understanding. Um that's you know that procedure hasn't been honored um she's just in this limbo where there there's nothing that's moving forward and the australian government isn't taking hard enough actions to help her leave the country because they have her passport and she can't leave she can't return to australia um while they judicially harass her 
if she if she did violate these laws charge her for it if she's charged the the in most of these the worst punishment is a fine okay hmm. a fine um, or a, like potentially up to a year in prison which is ludicrous okay but they're i believe that um uh punish or sentencing is for the sim card law i do not uh, it does not appear that they are pursuing that line of charges as heavily they seem to be pinning it on the passport thing which is basically a technicality at this point because of um various changes to the tanzania passports um it's uh, they're just harassing her judicially it's insane so just to be clear so kushik is saying tanzania is not muslim still blasphemy uh, there is an islamic group in tanzania that some people are reporting that is responsible for this harassment uh, there is no blasphemy law and some people criticize us for saying we didn't say ever that um this was because of blasphemy the only thing that we um there was Hamad mehta had it in his title uh, mm -hmm. that it was for blasphemy and when we post news articles on our facebook page uh we just use the title uh, of whoever uh, wrote the article we ourselves here at atheist republic never said um because we can't prove that this is for anything for about you know her activism or anything and we didn't claim it but we do have suspicions that uh, it might be because of her activism because of this islamic group in tanzania uh, in any case whether it is for that or not we this is uh, this is like extreme harassment for something that is not that big of a deal um and we do suspect that you know do you mind do you want to talk Susanna, about that group that i mentioned and the, the group that um you know more about that than me yeah so we have credible on the ground when by we i mean the um larger group of people who are working to ensure Zara's safety, who I affectionately call Zara's defenders. This is not an official name. Um, so uh, we have credible information that her former community known as the Koja Shia Ethna Sheri Jamaat um, group um, has um, incited these charges against her. Or not, well, th there isn't even a full-blown charge yet. Just they have... Um, in, in, in incited this judicial harassment i should say um they've threatened her life in the past um while she was in tanzania for the previous two months um two months before her arrest there were various things going on in the ground where they were harassing her um and um they made it very clear that they did not like zara being back in tanzania and mm -hmm. um this seems to have been an escalation of that um so although um tanzania is a christian majority country it is it's a secular country the demographics are christian majority um i've been told i don't know how true this is but i've been told that this uh koja shia if uh, nashari jamaat community is it while a minority um very influential in the country um i need to learn more about that but pe I, more than one person has um communicated that to me that this is actually a right. while a minority a powerful community um uh, yeah but i just want to clarify that if we do uh, we sometimes do make mistakes and if we did make a mistake in atheist republic and uh, we do uh, try to f figure it out and come and correct it but when it comes to zara k we didn't claim anything um i mean with this news um anything that didn't happen like we there's no like even if we suspect is because of this group we say that we're suspected um we have reason to believe we don't say it's definite we don't say it's certain we didn't say it was for blasphemy um again people keep there are some muslims that keep trying to act like we misreported something and we never did um they just yeah um we were very careful to make sure that we put out exactly what the people that are very heavily involved in this case um, are telling us that what we know and what we don't know um we only 
um, shared the information. There were some other people from some other groups that wanted to go out guns blazing and say a whole bunch of crap that wasn't even proven yet. Um, Zara Kay herself um, at the moment may have said some things on Twitter while she was being arrested, which is um, may, may not be may may or may not be true. But again, holding somebody uh, to a standard of journalists and activists. Um, outside of like when they're not holding Zara and that situation to that standard is absolutely ridiculous. Um, the people that like Council of ex, um, ex, uh, Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain have been very responsible at reporting it the way that they should be reporting it and some other groups as well. Uh, a lot of activists around this uh, news have been very responsible at making sure that they put out the information uh, that they're supposed to be and not put information that they don't know if it's, it's going to put Zara uh, at greater risk than uh, she needs to be. Um, so the, the entire process around um, highlighting this is, has been very good by most people. Some people really effed up, and it's good that we know that who they are so that we don't collaborate with them in the future. Um, some people leaked, Yasmin Muhammad um, leaked some information that she shouldn't have, and we yeah, now know. And her, no, I just wanted to just quickly add that, and, and her apology showed that she didn't understand why she did wrong, so we know not to mm -hmm. work with her anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I just wanted to. Uh, uh, oh, and one other thing is, um, yeah. So going forward, we're going to learn a lot uh, with what to, how to deal with uh, situations like this when an activist is in, is in trouble. And one last thing I want to mention is that we will most often, when we when there is an ex-Muslim or an atheist or a secular activist in trouble, uh, and we need to go help them, um, in most cases, we're not going to have. 100% uh, certain information about what's happening uh, before. Uh, so, and if we wait for that, then we can't do anything. Like they're most active, most cases should we should be ignoring. Like if, every time a secular or an atheist or an extremism activist gets in trouble somewhere around the world, and you guys are like, well, we can't move forward unless we know 100% sure what happens. We're not, most of the time, we're not gonna be 100% sure what's happening. So that will, um, we, we, we have to move forward with helping people, even if we're not 100% sure. Uh, we just have to mention, be careful about how we word it and say like, we have, it's likely this, we have reason to believe it has been reported rather than claiming that we're certain about what's happening. So the reporting, uh, the language that we use is imp more important in this situation rather than telling us to don't do anything until you're 100% sure. That's unreasonable. But uh, go on, Susanna, you want to say something? Um, yeah, so a lot of people may be familiar with various drama that happened regarding the leak of certain confidential information from Zara's um, defense team. And I would just like to say, um, guys, like I, I, I understand like the desire to talk about a lot of this, but what's import most important right now is getting Zara home safe. And one of the things that is most problematic about all that drama that happened is that it detracted from getting Zara home safe. Days were spent cleaning up that mess that could have been spent furthering and progressing Zara's situation. So while personally, I still have a lot more that I would like to say about what happened there, I'm not touching that until Zara's home safe. And I hope other people prioritize that as well. So people are asking in the chat, what can we do to help? Like I said below, there is a link that I put in the description just called Help Zara. In that link, it provides contact information, people you can tag on Twitter, on Facebook, et cetera, of Australian authorities that you should politely demand to increase their involvement in this situation. Um, but Rivka, do you have anything to add? Welcome to the show, my dear. <laughs> Hi, um, just a couple things. So um, I'm agreeing with what you're saying about the way you proceed is important and not to waste time because the ultimate goal is to bring Zara back. We can deal with other things once that's occurred. But I also wanted to mention the sample letter to Australian government that you and I had um, come up with because people have contacted me and wanted to know 
you know, well, what should I write or how should I? So we have sort of a template, which I think we can put on um, maybe the Help Sara page. It's also on mine, the Kent Community Secular Alliance page. So that gives you sort of a sense of how you want to word it. It's short. It's to the point. You could use it. You could not use it, but it might help for people to see something like that. All right, we spent so much time on this first thing, so we should probably um, ah, go Suha to... provided the link here. Thank oh, you, thank you, Saint Suha. Saint Suha, our saint, our very own saint. Um, okay, should we go? You want to get to some hilarious news. Oh, is it? So uh, wait, is it clapping? It's hilarious. very clappable. It's juicy. It's not even religion related, but it's so good. I had to do it. <laughs> next news. Okay, next news. Indian man spied for Pakistan in exchange for nudes. <laughs> yes, God. Okay. In India. Indians, India's Crime Inspection Department, or the CID, apprehended a man enticed by Pakistan's Inter-Services Intelligence, or ISI, to leak sensitive information with nude photos of women and seductive conversation with them, <laughs> conversations with them, India Today reported. <laughs> he added that his greed for more pornography led him to reveal secret military information. <laughs> um, Sat... Uh, Satyan Narayan uh, Paliwal has been booked and arrested by the CID special branch on espionage charges. He has confessed to being in touch with an agent of Pakistan intelligence of the Pakistani intelligence agency and possessing sensitive military information, said Rajasthan police, as per a report in uh, ANI. While being interrogated, uh, Paliwal claimed women tempted him on behalf of ISI. They uh, often had erotic conversations with him and shared nude photos to persuade him to share information regarding the army's movement in border areas in the Pakran firing range. Paliwal said he became greedy and started sending more sensitive information about the Indian agency, uh, Indian army to the agency for more photos and long conversations. <laughs> that must be some off some bobs and vagine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To yeah, make yeah. him betray his country like that. And and Luke is bringing up a he Luke just read my mind because he's saying this is what happens when you ban sexy cop. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, we're saving your country by giving you blasphemous arts that the sexy blasphemous arts, so you don't have to ask give away sensitive information. Wait, I don't understand. The um the does this guy not know how to get porn online like does he not know like it's like it should be very easy maybe the like what effect i i i think he was maybe under the impression that these were real women he was talking to and i think thank you Hara sultan Hara sultan is saying bobs and vagine um right. <laughs> um i think he was under the impression that these were real women that he was talking to um and that maybe like made it more Tantalizing mm -hmm. and titillating. Well, it's not real. And we know it wasn't real women. It was just like people, other people pretending. That's definitely what it sounded like, based on um, the way that I read the reports on this. Wait, yeah, so the Pakistan doesn't sounds like the ISI was, you know, setting him up, kind of, or fishing to see what would happen. That was like the to, impression like to I catch got. a predator style. To catch a predator style. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Okay, no. So wait a minute. So pocket. I. By the way, people know ISI is uh, Pakistan's intelligence agency, right? So, um, I don't understand. Pakistan's intelligence agency could not afford some real sexy Pakistani woman to come and do FaceTime with this guy. I mean, you're getting secret information. You had to get Armin, men. Armin, here's the deal. They didn't even need to. 
Mm. They didn't even need to go to that length. They probably could have. They didn't even need to. <laughs> That's how much this guy needs the Bob and Virgin. I was going to say, he's such a Bob and Virgin addict. He was jonesing so hard. All they had to do was dangle a little in front of him, and he was giving up, you know, all kinds of stuff. All right. It so it's so not funny. that. Um, so it's like so it so it's not that he just wanted like any porn he just wanted he thought that this is very special because he was getting it from i'm hearing a little bit of echo if you could reduce my volume that would be great um or mute yourself when i'm talking um he 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 wanted to make sure that he's like the reason why this was so appealing to him is because he thought that he's in conversation with the people that he's getting the bobs and the jeans from right i believe that's why so. this was Okay, okay, okay. So, uh, Matthew is saying mission SIMP. <laughs> I think both Pakistan and India should go and recruit like their sexiest woman. If I mean, I'm pretty sure like the, the, the level of this, I bet you <laughs> that the level of desperation in India, both India and Pakistan has become, has gotten so high that both countries could actually use their sexiest woman as a way to um get leaked information from the other side that should be that should be a movie katie this is saying a movie. mission simp possible <laughs> <laughs> and ali is saying betrayed country for country except the second one is spelled a little bit different <laughs> and luke saying is this reverse love jihad <laughs> hey <laughs> Oh my god. Man, man. So um this is uh this is just delightful news. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um it was really funny. Um Har Sultan did a video on this and I believe I commented something like uh this is why they need sexy Kali. Like he could have, yeah. he could have used some sexy collie, and we could have avoided this whole situation altogether. Um, but, but he's not going to be able to speak to sexy Kelly. That's what I he think, wants. Oh, you're right. He wants that 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 personal edge. Hmm. Um, Maybe I mean, have a fantasy. sexy collie doll or something he with a come. you know <laughs> tape in there no. to say certain things. <laughs> I'm guessing the the uh, there's the idea of this whole scenario is add something to it. Like it's not just the uh, like I'm just guessing, right? Like I'm just saying, I, I, it's not just the naked body. It's the idea of like the tension, the secrecy, the suspense behind this exchange i think that must be because it can't be just because of bobs and the jeans there must be something that like makes this whole thing a lot more exciting than just watching like you know i think well, he so. did I think, like, say that he was like in conversation with them and it almost felt like it was a relationship or at least he perceived it that way to some degree in terms I of, think the, the, you know, I think what's at stake here and him giving out like talking to a sp female spy that just like, you know, something like that. There must be something more to it than just like, yeah, I need to see naked body. I think like the, the, the this guy's fantasy was like, I don't know. I don't think like, yeah, I don't think this guy's like even sexy Callie would satisfy this guy. I don't know. I'm just trying to, I can't, you can't be that desperate that just like, I just need to see some titties and I will be like Armin, I think I, will, uh, I think you underestimate the male population mm. or overestimate mm. them. Mm, mm, mm. I don't know. Like like I I'm said on our, our Q and A, mm. a lot of men have a hard time managing one relationship, okay? <laughs> or even landing one relationship, let alone uh managing it, okay? <laughs> this man <laughs> Oh, yeah, he, he admitted his own, his own, his own greed for the titties. Greed for nudes. What? Look at this poster. What is this? Oh, someone just made, like a funny meme out of this. I thought this was funny because they they made it look like a a movie poster, right? A story and... of betrayal and honey trap. <laughs> 
the honey <laughs> trap, right? Like in, they trapped him, you know, but they trapped him with honey. They honey trapped him, you know? It's just, it's just chef's kiss. Mm. Oh. That was, yeah, that was pretty good. Um, okay, look at, look at, uh, should I shame somebody in the Facebook live chat? I know who you're going after. Maybe look at this. if they keep it up. No, no, I'm going to shame them. Yes. Okay, let's do this. I might have missed it, but do you guys actually talk about the important things? Um, Lorraine, you were here at the top of the show where we're you talking were... about freeing a secular activist from judicial harassment. We started yeah, the show with the you're an idiot, Lorraine. going on in our community. Are you, are you you're fucking You're a moron. Kidding me? You were here. You were right here with us, you idiot. Oh, my God. I'm sorry. I have to call you out. Okay. Yeah. You were commenting on it. God damn it. Yes, we talk about it. And again, here's another thing. What, a way to get actually an audience to talk about, uh, to pay attention to important things is to talk about fun things. So you grow an audience. Oh. So you expose them to important things. That's a strategy. Okay. You, you give them, you promise them some dessert so you could ma make them eat their vegetables. That's how it works. Okay. God damn it. Anyways, is the next news vegetables or dessert? Um, uh, more vegetables. It's more but Brussels it's, sprouty. But it's very interesting. <laughs> it's a little bit niche, but it's very yeah. interesting to me, and that's why I wanted to talk about it today. Um, so, I mean, I guess we can clap. Okay. Next news. Next news. Ahmadiyya's sex faith in question in Malaysia. On mm -hmm. March 19th, the High Court in Malaysia will decide whether the Ahmadiyya sect of Islam is legally considered Muslims or otherwise. This will be a key development, as thus far, Pakistan is the only nation to have officially declared, declared Ahmadis to be non-Muslims. Uh, a three-member Court of Appeals bench chaired by uh, Badaria Shahamid sent uh, the case back on August 27th, ordering the High Court to ascertain the individual's religious beliefs. Uh, Badaria, who has since retired, said that the uh, Selangor Sharia Court had no jurisdiction over them if they were Ahmadiyya by authentic faith. She said that, should it be proven that they were following the faith after apostatizing from Islam, the religious court had authority over them. Going back to July 6, 2018, uh, Vazir ruled that the Selangor Sen <laughs> Sharia court had no right to interfere with the uh, of religious activities in the Ahmadiyya community. Muslims from larger sects, such as Sunnism, generally regard Ahmadis as non-Muslims, apostates, or heretics. The judge also ruled that the Selangor Islamic Religious Department does not have the legal authority to bring charges against members of the sect for violating the state fatwa against Ahmadiyya teachings. So this is kind of niche, so I want to pick apart some of the things that are going on here. So... Someone, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that Pakistan is the only nation to have declared Ahmadiyyas to be non-Muslims. In fact, it, I believe it's even an aspect of their constitution since 1974. Okay. Um, so here, the uh, Malaysian, so, so they're saying um, that the Sharia courts in Malaysia do not have authority over Ahmadis, Ahmadis because they are not even Muslims to begin with. So so this um, judge that since retired uh, but was originally involved with this case said that it should be proven that they were following the faith that should they be following the faith after apo apostatizing from Islam the religious accord would have authority over them. What she means here is if they are found to be following mainstream Islam after being involved in the Ahmadiyya community, which she clarified or um, referenced as apostatizing from Islam, only then would the Sharia court have authority over them. 
Um, so, and there, there were various precedents that happened throughout the years of judges saying that the Sharia courts do not have authority over Ahmadi Muslims because they're not even Muslim. They're takfiring them. They're declaring them to be non-Muslim. Um, so this is a very, um, it's a very tricky subject. And I thought this was an extremely interesting development because like I said, only Pakistan has gone to this length of anti-Ahmadi bigotry. Rivka? Very so funny. the judge's ruling and the pr precedent that she cited have already in a sense made a de facto ruling that they're not Muslims because the ruling itself is doing that. And it appears that the Muslim community wants it both ways. They're not Muslims, but yet they have authority over them in Sharia court as if they were. Exactly. And, and so one other example of why, first of all, you shouldn't have religious courts because there doesn't seem to be any logic there. If they're not Muslims, then they're not subject to the same rules. So therefore, why are they feeling like they have you know, some special ability to, to judge them in a Sharia court. But even beyond that, why are there two courts for different groups of people anyways? So it's a yeah. kind of interesting esoteric discussion because basically she's calling them out saying, you know, look, if you think they're not Muslims, then you have no business attempting to interfere in there because they're not, saying that to other minorities, for example, Christians or Jews or Hindus or Buddhists or whomever, they don't feel they have authority over them. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to mute you because Big T is barking. Um, I think it's really interesting because <laughs> on one hand it's like, awesome, I don't want to have the Sharia court having jurisdiction over me. <laughs> But, like, this is not the right reason for it to not have authority over you. It's because they're takfiring you. Um, well, also, like, it's so the Ahmadis aren't Muslim because other people have decided, but they think that they might be. So where does that leave them? It's all these outside authorities making decisions for the, you know, you're not hearing from any Ahmadiyya um, spokesperson either which is interesting to me. Yeah, so I just to give a little bit of background, um, they uh, part of this arose because of a, uh, a group including 20 Malaysians, eight Pakistani asylum seekers, two Indian nationals, and in Indonesia performed Friday prayers in 2014 at a community center in uh, Sanglangor, which was challenged by um, the uh, Islamic Religious Department, which is known by the uh, Malaysian acronym JAIS. So they concluded that Islamic authorities in Sangalore do not recognize Ahmadiyya as Muslims. Therefore, uh, JAIS has no basis for charging them with Sharia offenses. Um, so... And part of this was because JAIS told the group that contrary to um, Section 97 of the Administration of the Religion of Islam in the state of Sangalore. So imagine having an administration for the <laughs> religion of Islam enactment in uh, 2003. They failed to obtain written permission to use the premises. Um, they claimed that the group should only be allowed to utilize the community center in Sangalore for purposes in or by a mosque. So as far as this has to do with like they're even restricting their um, right to assembly because um, they are not the right kind of Muslims. Um, it's uh, it's it, I, Malaysia, don't become like Pakistan, please, <laughs> please. Um Armin, what this is, is your thoughts? No, I just wanted to remind people that how um, Malaysia is often used as an example of how moderate an Islamic country can be. Uh, so it's a good reminder by people like Reza Aslan or, or his likes. 
Indonesia and Malaysia are often used as an example for that. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, just like yeah, guys, but yeah, this is a be- the best you could hope for um, from an Islamic country, right? So the worst that you could hope for is Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, uh, Iran, and Bangladesh. Okay, so which we know all that is how bad things can get over there. But even the best, the most moderate. Uh, the most liberal Islamic countries uh, that are supposed to be, I wouldn't con- count Tunisia because Tunisia is like mm, the government's at least trying to be secular there, but Islamic countries as in like Islam is a major influence in the government. Uh, if you think about Malaysia and Indonesia, these are supposed to be the best examples. And this is what you get uh, out from the best examples, like getting closer and closer to what, Pakistan is like, or Saudi Arabia are like. This is why you don't reform Islam. This is why you don't ask for moderate Islam. This is why you ask for the end of Islam, right? This is why you ask for abolishing Islam rather than changing Islam. Uh, and Adam has some feedback. So Adam here is actually in Malaysia and Malaysian. Moderate my foot. I live here and everyone who is not Muslim has to walk on eggshells. Yeah, but that's not what Ressa Aslan wants you to think. Um, <laughs> um, right. Of note, um, so this judge who originally heard the appeals said that, th- this is just kind of a um, side note, said that the information provided on identity cards regarding Malaysians' spiritual status was not conclusive proof of their faith. So hmm. just they have to have your spiritual status identified on your identification okay that's what 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 <laughs> okay and actually she's right okay just having something randomly on an id card is not proof that you are that way there are a lot of closeted ex-muslims for example and but she means it in the context of just because these people say that they're muslim doesn't mean that they're actually muslim they're probably heretics or our, our, our courts are leaning in the direction of um, declaring them apostates because she referred to them as apostatizing from Islam. Um, it's just yeah. it's just wild. Uh, shouts out to all the, uh, what's the word for it? Uh, Munafik in uh, Malaysia. Munafikin, yeah. yes. I mean, yeah, Ahmadis, if you want to consider yourself ex-Muslims, uh, we welcome you. We're more accepting of, ex- you know, if if you want to define yourself as ex-Muslims, we, we'll, we'll call it that. Um, but I, I'm pretty sure you don't want that. Um, oh my okay, God. so if, let me just clarify this. This is what you get when you have oil. Uh, yeah, Malaysia doesn't have oil. I don't know what you're talking about. Malaysia, <laughs> Malaysia doesn't have Okay, oh, yeah. Lorraine is saying, this has always been it's... my problem with this channel. You seem to think the U.S. or the U.K. can help when it is clear oh, that they're ones that have effed everything up. Well, Lorraine, literally, no one <laughs> mentioned America when talking about this news. You brought it up. You're <laughs> making shit up. We're talking about a very esoteric little thing in Malaysian law. I'm not sure how that relates to... I mean, it's so esoteric. Some people, you would expect they would say, why are you even bothering with this rather than go to this other, you know, DEFCON 5 about America. Yeah, most people don't even understand why this niche topic is important. (laughs) They don't even understand why this niche topic of a government declaring a minority sect to be apostates or heretics is important or unusual, okay? Because... Again, I, I actually, I, I believe that it is only Pakistan that has declared Ahmadis to be non-Muslims. But I, I need other people to help me um, with that claim. Um, because I'm not just going to always believe Wikipedia. Okay, let, let's just say, Lorena says, don't need much knowledge to smell the bullshit. Yeah, you don't, for somebody that thinks Malaysia has, is, is has going through all of this because of Malaysia's oil, you clearly, <laughs> I don't know, Lorraine. Like the you, I don't peanut, know. Peanut <laughs> oil, peanut oil. Yeah. <laughs> what about this? It's okay, but guys, Lorraine is embarrassing herself. It's okay. Oh no, Anyways, but I love we that, um, 
Ghost Bunny is saying hashtag highlight Lorraine's comments. <laughs> Glad to hear from Lorraine. <laughs> yes, Katie saying Lorraine's comments are good for comedy. Yeah, they actually, I, I, they are so ridiculous. I do, I'm tempted not to highlight them, but they are funny. So it makes it, me it smile. does. It makes it makes people realize how much ignorance is out there. So they're good for highlighting because some people sometimes people forget how dumb people can be. So Lorraine is here to remind us of that. Uh, thank you, Lorraine, for sure. Yeah, hell yeah. For demonstrating. Anyway, um, we should move uh, to the next news, right? Can we yeah. clap for the next news? No. No. Okay. Next news. Okay. Next news. Muslims jailed for forced conversion of Sikh girl in Pakistan. Um, an anti-terrorism court, for those who are not familiar, we say terrorism when we refer to such acts like boom boom because of the YouTube algorithm. Okay. An anti-terrorism court in Pakistan sentenced three out of the eight Muslims accused to imprisonment along with a fine for the forced kidnapping, conversion, and marriage of a Sikh girl in 2019. The court sentenced Muhammad Ehsan to, two, uh, to jail for two years. The other two, Muhammad Salman and Muhammad Ahmed, were penalized with six months in prison and a fine of uh, 10,000 rupees each. The case gained legal attention after Jagit Kar was forcibly taken from her home by Muhammad Ehsan and his family. They later forced uh, Kaur to convert to Islam and marry Ehsan, changing her name from Jagat Kaur to Aisha. The matter gained global attention when the Sikh community demanded that Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan honor his claim about the protection of minority communities in the country and ensure the return of Kaur to her family. The community also presented significant allegations regarding the first co forced conversion of minorities in Pakistan. Um, so this is important news for a couple reasons. One, um, unfortunately, it is not very often that people are at, off, um, actually prosecuted for, um, kidnapping and raping, um, minority girls who are minors and, um, forcing them to convert and forcing them into marriage. Um, second, I find this to be extremely important news given how light the sentencing was. Okay. The main accused has, his sentence is two years. Two years. For kidnapping and raping a child. Okay. The other people only got six months in jail who were accomplices or a fine it's ludicrous and this is good news because someone is actually being prosecuted and penalized for this oftentimes those who are prosecuted are either the court validates the marriage or there's a lot of corruption that goes on people are paid off or things are just settled out of court or not settled at all because the victims and their families are threatened with violence and death if they continue to pursue these people legally. This is the good news, you guys. This is what we can expect as the basically the best case of justice. And it's insane. Um, to give some more context to this news, there's a little bit more that goes into this. So um, our uh, news writer uh, pointed out to me that um, different news sources are reporting that the main accused is um, a different person. So just to be fully transparent, I'm going to give that information here. So of note, India.com, which is what I um, pulled in my main description, um, specifies that it was Mohammed Asan who was sentenced to two years. However, Clarion Indian News report differs, stating that it was Imran uh, Krishti, who is Asan's older brother, that was the man who was sentenced to two years. So it's either this man or his brother. So that's just being transparent. 
about our reporting. Um, another thing that went into this story, there was kind of two events that happened. There was the uh, kidnapping and forced conversion and marriage, read rape of this minority Sikh girl. Okay, and then there was also this event of um, the community um, vandalizing a Sikh place of worship. So um, th several people were also found guilty of vandalism and inciting violence by assembling others to target and attack the Nakana Sahib Gurd Gurdwara, a Sikh place of worship. The other five accused were acquitted by the court. Um, so what happened was that on in uh, many local Muslims gathered outside of this Sikh place of worship and they started chanting slogans and um, maintaining that the uh, Sikh community was using its influence um, to manipulate the situation um, and that, um, uh, sorry, blah, 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 blah. And so, yeah, so because of this, um, the many uh, first information reports, police reports were filed against people for inciting um, others against the Sikh community, which resulted in sp spreading panic amongst the locals. Um, and uh, many of these people um, face uh, terrorism charges, blasphemy charges following the attack on this Sikh place of worship. Um, and I mean, it just goes to show how shit minorities are treated in Pakistan and, um, certain prime ministers really like to pretend like, uh, they have, they, they like to accuse other people of Islamophobia while, uh, minorities in their countries are treated like this. And uh, Rivka? Um, just to echo some of what Susanna was saying about the way minorities are treated, but, and to your point that this is significant in the fact that someone is actually being prosecuted. Now, you're, I share your opinion that the punishment hardly seems significant enough for such an act. But the fact that someone is being held accountable is good, regardless of whether we believe that they should be punished for a longer time or they should have a more extreme form of punishment because as you were saying often either no charges sometimes they charge the girls even um so and that they're she but this is an indication of someone who has a lot of support behind her as well this young woman her family her family continuing to pressure for this, advocating for a lot of other things to change. So, I mean, I'm glad that there she's, you know, her situation's been solved, but it still is, you know, kind of a trickle in the bucket of what needs to be done here and on a much grander scale. I do want to mention that these are the real cases of forced conversions that India, uh, India's BGP wishes they had mm -hmm. so that they could use as a way to go anti-Muslim even stronger. This is like, th these are the stuff that uh, happens mostly in Pakistan, not in India, but India wants to make you believe in this government. It wants to make you believe that this is happening in India uh, a lot as a way to go f full, uh, just to go uh, ethno nationalists on you and everybody and create a two tier system between Hindus and Muslims. Um, but every time you do point out that this whole forced conversion and the love jihad, uh, conspiracy theories in India are just that they're just conspiracy theories. They bring up stories like this, uh, as a way to prove you wrong. And basically they're using real victim, real victims, uh, real examples of actual forced conversion and, and of real examples of rape as a way to come up with a story about something much bigger that is not real as a way to push their political agenda, right? So highlight stories of um, Hindu um, Hindus and Sikh girls uh, and boys, I don't know, um, if, if they do get kidnapped and raped and forced to convert to Islam, 
uh, highlight them, but also be mindful of some far-right Hindu nationalists um, trying to use that story as a way to push their political agenda, right? So mm -hmm. if you follow to, uh, down that path of activism and want to highlight that, be careful to just only so, uh, highlight legitimate uh, sources and actual make sure that the story is credible make sure that the news outlet that you're um, sharing that that is uh, highlighting a story like this is not somewhere like op india um who's like they they love stories like this as a way to sell their own political agenda so just be highlight these stories without being used by far-right hindus okay mm -hmm. um <laughs> yes Florian is saying you all have Western accents. I'm confused why you don't target these crimes where you can actually have some influence on your own home ground. Lorraine, Armin literally has an Iranian accent. No, Susie, <laughs> like, she's a she's a troll. She's a she's a troll. I know, Stop but it's just like, come on. You think we no, don't, the, we can also don't hear highlight her. No, other... no, she 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 doesn't mean it. She just she just likes the attention. She's she's trying to find ways to trigger. She's 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 uh, useless. Forget it. I, I thought she was demanding I, Lorraine. No, I mean it was funny. <laughs> a little, no, it, it was funny to begin with, but now she's like now that she she's addicted to attention, so now she's just trying to find s things to say to get highlighted. It's it becomes boring after a while. Fine. Um, yes, yeah, good. Um, all right, can we? Can we highlight? Can we clap for the next news? Um, it's not something we support. Um, okay, but, but nobody know. died, nobody, no nobody was raped, and nobody was nobody died, and nobody was raped, right? That that's our standard here. Yep, that's our standard for clap. Like, yeah, we have we have low standards. We have to. We can. Yeah. Did you Repair. fail to speak in code twice in a row? I'm sorry, I had to bring it No, up. I mean, it's, yeah, I know you're right because I'm saying it because Susanna just mentioned uh, the R word like a couple of times. I was like, I guess we're going, I guess we're like ignoring all the code. Um, uh, usually it's me, so I just felt like the need yeah. to go. <laughs> yeah, no, no, Rivka, the reason why we highlighted when you make a mistake is because we're anti Semitic. <laughs> oh, no. Like, how could. How do you not get that? Like, obviously, we're biased against Oh, you. I get it. That's why I'm bringing <laughs> it up. We didn't get we didn't get all this resources that we were promised by your oh, higher no. up and that's no. why that's why that's why we're like we're mask off now we're just mask off okay <laughs> guys we're joking <laughs> we're um, joking we're joking we're joking all right oh my god no but yeah Susie, like okay like but but to be fair like wait suzy why are you just like using the r word like left and right like stop it now Let's I mean, just like let's pretend that we're not anti-Semitic. At least let's just pretend, okay? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, guys, I'm sorry. Sometimes the mask just slips. <laughs> yes. Yes. All okay. right. So I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do. Like, let's be more careful. Maybe when our editor cuts these parts out, at least these parts don't have any like words that will trigger yes. the algorithm. Okay. Uh, next news. Next news, LGBT Virgin Mary declared blasphemous in Poland. So this is a um, news that uh, we will continue to cover because this is an ongoing case. Um, so three female Polish activists are on trial facing two years in prison for offending religious beliefs. The indictment follows uh, a, an indictment in 2019 when posters and stickers bearing the rainbow haloed version of the Black Madonna appeared near a church in Plock, a city in central Poland. The doctored image uh, traded the golden halos around the Virgin Mary and the infant Jesus with representations of a rainbow flag, a common symbol of the LGBT community. Authorities charged the women with offending religious beliefs under Article 196 of Poland's criminal code. The trial, which began this past Wednesday, um, captivates international attention for both the use of the controversial law protecting religious feelings and raising the issue of LGBTQ rights in Poland. Last year, President uh, Andrzej Duda told an election rally that, quote, 
LGBT ideology was more dangerous than communism. Wow. So, Say it with me in the live chat. Wow. 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 <laughs> um, so I wanted to highlight this news for a number of reasons. Um, one, um, a lot of people want to act like Christianity is a neutered religion. Um, it's not. It just depends on where you live right because um, a lot of times when we were talking about the whole blasphemy controversy surrounding the prophet muhammad or sexy kali people are like um oh you know well, like people could do this about jesus and no one cares anymore right that's actually not true people do care and people are being criminalized for this just in other countries okay so i wanted to highlight that because we need to highlight the christianity still has a problem with blasphemy okay we have we we haven't moved on from this okay it's rare or more rare but it's still a problem no um, wait it's not rare it's rare for it to become government policy to be this yes. homophobic is christians being homophobic is not rare but being government policy to be this homophobic is well, rare we will have, yeah things. it's the homophobia that's present in a lot of countries' criminal codes, to be fair. But it is more rare for a heavily Catholic country to be have it in the law about this clause of hurting religious feelings. That's not something we see in Europe as much nowadays. That That is more rare. So that's what I was referring to. I'm talking about this blasphemy charge. Um, uh, of note, the International Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Trans Intersex Association ranks Poland as the most anti-gay country in the European Union. Guys, this is the European Union, and this is what's occurring here. But I wanted to cover this news because the first um, hearing uh, was this past week, so we're going to continue to get more information on this case, and I'm going to continue to highlight it for the reasons I mentioned previously. Um, and this news article that our editor wrote actually taught me some things that I didn't know about this case because we've covered this before. So they created these stickers of the Virgin Mary with the uh, halo for a specific reason that I didn't know about before. They created the stickers and posters with an LGBT flair in protest of an Easter display the church put up listing sins that believers were supposed to fight against. Sins like greed, hate, envy and also lgbt and gender the images quickly became widespread on social media and appeared on banners at subsequent lgbt equality parades meaning the images of the rainbow mary um one of the um three women accused said what what i saw was hatred contempt aggression uh, and then added that they made these stickers to protest the hypocrisy of the church which hasn't dealt with um pedophilia okay code word for um an attraction to very young people okay pedophilia that the church hasn't dealt with pedophilia scandals while attacking lgbt uh, people so i actually didn't know that this poster originated because this uh, local church was saying that LGBT and gender was a sin that had to be actively fought against, you know, so they were, this was protesting something very specific, and then it took on a greater life throughout Poland. Um, and uh, so they were putting up posters with the same image with the words like, rainbows don't offend, you know, on several churches in Warsaw, uh, and the ruling um, law and justice party, which is the ruling party of Poland's offices. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so th there were some other instances where it came up in d different cities where it became um, even more uh, popularly known and more controversial. Um, so, yes, this is, uh, we're going to continue to follow this. And uh, someone in the chat was saying that we need LGBT Mary blasphemy. And I agree. Yes, actually, can we make uh, one an art with, specifically dedicated to Poland's government with a lesbian Mary? I don't well, know who her partner will be. 
but with also yeah. an L but but with also the halo should be uh lgbt flag but we should make that and we should make that and we should make a blasphemous art dedicated to that um and also try to get it on the news that this is a dedication a gift from atheist republic to put the polish uh government i have a, a great suggestion by the people in the live chat who came up with this um, i added I, it to our list right now yeah um i do want to know whether e what the eu is doing in response to this i mean this is not the standards that eu should be like accepting are they heavily pushing like is, are there consequences for poland because of eu for this um that's one question second just to clarify i know some people are going to say guys this is old news uh, as susanna mentioned the reason why this is being covered now is because she was charged in 2019 and now this is the trial and all that that's that's the recent news yes the charging that's old news that's two years old but the trial and every uh, updates with regards to trial brings this news back to attention. Um, yeah, so, and one thing else I want to mention before we go to Rivka, I do want to mention uh, say that this is getting a lot of attention because LGBT rights um, is very good, rights movements and groups and outlets and platforms and podcasts and YouTube channels um and left-leaning uh, human rights activists are very very good at um, highlighting the anti-lgbt and the homophobic angle of this uh, the problem is that the atheist and secular movement is not as strong and as um you know has doesn't have as big of an idea audience and influence to highlight the fact that blasphemy being a thing at all um, like th if this was pure blasphemy and it wasn't homophobic, it wouldn't have gotten the attention that it deserved. You know what I mean? So this being just blas having blasphemy law in a European country, even if it wasn't homophobic by itself, should uh, should get a crap ton of attention that it wouldn't have. So I'm not saying, by the way, I'm glad that it's getting attention because even the fact that you have any homophobic laws even if it has nothing to do with religion, even if it's not blasphemy, I'm glad that there's a giant movement out there playing that, uh, you know, role and doing the activism on that front. But I'm just hoping that the secular movement, the secular activists and the atheist activists, one, like we should look at the gay rights activists and the LGBT rights activists as a role model, as something to aspire to, as something to get to so that this blasphemy side of this also gets uh, would have gotten the same level of attention one day even if it wasn't homophobic like any blasphemy laws are insane um and the fact that we have it in the european country um you might think like well it's not as it's not as bad as many other countries uh, that like that are islamic or hindu it's not as bad as their blasphemy laws and that's true but this excuses them because if you go after India, after Pakistan, after Iran, after Saudi Arabia, with their much harsher, much more barbaric blasphemy laws, they always use countries like this as like, look, even Poland has blasphemy laws, right? Even the countries that you, even European countries that are supposed to be the role model for human rights, even they have blasphemy laws. Why are you coming at us for? We're just doing the same thing. I know that's ridiculous, but they do use it as a way to justify their blasphemy laws, right? Yeah, so they say what i said it's about consistency yes yes so this is like going after poland is not just for the sake of making poland a better place it's also for making sure that this doesn't set a precedent for other countries to do the same thing um, um Rivka, you want to say something yeah yeah um mostly um my thoughts concern the fact as you were saying that this is happening in the european union which clearly these ideas of blasphemy laws and then the government punishing people for an opinion or a piece of art, you know, um, whether folks like it or not, seems to go against a lot of what the European Union is stands for. And so I'm wondering if this is going to be brought to the court in the European Union. Should they be convicted? Because that to me would be the next step. I mean, Poland being part of the union they have certain rights but they also have certain responsibilities and certain um 
things that they need to conform to in terms of, you know, civil rights laws and things like that. So I certainly hope that, you know, if should something happen and they are convicted, that this will then further go to the European Union court. And it'll be interesting to see what ha- what would happen then in that case. Because, you know, Poland is becoming um, much more authoritarian and definitely returning to a lot of anti-Semitism. There's a lot of, uh, you know, homophobia and outright bigotry perpetrated mm-hmm. by the government on people. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that right there, at least in my opinion, sort of puts their um, membership in the European Union a little bit in, in question. It's debatable. Yeah, Luke had a hilarious comment regarding um, the original poster that inspired this of the listing of sins. Ah, uh, yes, the eight deadly sins, wrath, lust, envy, sloth, pride, gluttony, greed, and gender. <laughs> Kenji's saying, plot twist, everyone in Poland declares themselves a gender because gender is a sin. <laughs> okay, listing gender as a sin is insane because um, everyone, you, you have a gender. It's, it's a like little when, overbroad, to yeah, say yeah. the least. It's like when people equate gender studies with women's studies. It's like, no, gender study, everyone has a gender, okay? Women's studies is women's studies. There's a difference, you guys. Like, <laughs> Or when people equate sexuality studies with gay studies. No, it, one is a sub-label of the larger thing. But... um. Yes, that's about all I have to say on this news. Should we move to the next one? Oh, you're muted. Oh, I was saying, yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm, let's go. Let's move on. No, sorry. <laughs> I, I just saw an error. Uh, I was try- busy trying to get it to our um, web developer um, just to make sure I don't forget. Uh, I saw an error on our website. So I'm just Okay. Can we do... Um, can we do a clap? Uh, clap? Yes. Yeah. Next news. Next news. Former U.S. presidential spiritual advisor sentenced to six years in prison. Okay. In the United States of America, the former Houston megachurch pastor, Kirby John Codwell. Now that is a name for you. Kirby John Codwell. Cladwell. No, Cladwell was once a spiritual advisor to Presidents George W. Bush and Barack Obama. The pastor was a frequent visitor to the White House during the George W. Bush administration and even officiated Jenna Bush's wedding. In Louisiana, authorities sentenced Codwell to uh, six years in federal prison for defrauding more than two dozen people out of millions of dollars by selling them worthless Chinese bonds. According to a statement from the U.S. Attorney's Office in Louisiana, uh, Caldwell said, and, no, and Louisiana financial advisor Gregory Allen Smith were indicted in uh, 2018 by federal office officials after encouraging 29 people to invest about $3.5 million uh, between April 2013 and August 2014 in historical bonds issued by China before the communist takeover in 1949. They told investors that they could see returns as high as 15 times their initial investment. Sadly, the bonds from the former Republic of China existed only before the communist takeover there in 1949. Now the bonds are considered to be no more than collectible memorabilia by the Securities and Exchange Commission. Ah, so Alex is raising the important question of what is the spiritual advisor to the president, no less? Alex, this is an um, excellent no, question. No, 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 no. Look at the number of questions. That's, you didn't read it right. Alex is not asking, what is the spiritual advisor? The number of question marks makes me believe that Alex is asking, what is a spiritual advisor? That's how it's he's shocked. He's like, what the hell? So you have to read it right. I want to point out that not only did this supposedly religious person who, you know, is guided by a higher morality, 
um, <laughs> commit this fraud and defraud these people, but he was aided and abetted by a former Louisiana financial advisor. So the two of them are in cahoots together to defraud people. It's really, it's sad and it's very, um, again, the same situation we see all the time, this undue respect or trust afforded into a religious person. And therefore, you know, people would maybe not do the kind of due diligence they would normally do in a situation such as this. These two are working together. He's a religious person, particularly with these credentials to the White House. Oh, he must be telling me the truth. He would never, you know, he, you know, is in bow, endued with this trust and authority that is obviously unwarranted. Um, you were actually, Susanna, we're going to say, what's a spiritual advisor? I interrupted you and you never actually clarified. Oh, Lord only knows. Oh, <laughs> um, I, I always the fact that like this is a, a secular government, and like this is something that the executive branch yeah. is. Why is should they have them? them? Yeah, I mean, in yeah. their personal life, fine, they can do what they want. You know, personal advisor versus no presidential advisor, which gives a veneer of you know the state and the responsibilities you know, associated with that to this religious person. Um, yeah, but isn't that against the separation of church and state for it? Like, is this guy being paid by the taxpayer to advise the president on spiritual matters? Like the way I imagine it is like the kings that have like a grand wizard in like fairy tales and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what that's what I think a spiritual advisor is supposed to be. But like, isn't that like shouldn't that be illegal in the United States to ha for the president to have a spiritual advisor? I don't think this person's being paid as a cabinet member or anything like that. I think what they're getting paid with is the recognition that they can then transfer into other books in terms of getting Does paid it really by matter someone what they're getting... else to listen that... to them or to go to their church because they're associated with a president. Doesn't, doesn't matter what they're being paid as they like, if they're a cabinet member, they're being paid by the taxpayer, no? I don't think they're a cabinet member. There's, no, I don't think there's doesn't, a it doesn't member have, they of don't the have cabinet. To, I'm sorry, but they don't have to be a cabinet member to get paid as for, with the I taxpayer. I understand that, but I, right. I, I do not they're, think they're a formal part of the government, but I could be wrong on that. I mean, their, their title is U.S. President. I mean, even if they're getting paid by influence and higher status, as there's a monetary value to that. I don't know. But the, I mean, the fact that the president is spending any of his time being advised on spiritual stuff, that is his time is taxpayer resources, right? If, if he's spending, here's the thing. I think it should be illegal, even if the president of the United States does as little as spend half a second re opening the Bible, half of reading half a verse while he's on the like at the time that he's supposed to be serving while, the so while he's presidenting. <laughs> yeah, while he's president. Yeah, while he's presidenting. Actually, that's good. That's right. Yeah, I'm gonna go out. That. That's pretty good. Yeah, <laughs> while he's presidenting. Well, he's, that should be legal. You're like you read your goddamn Bible when you're on your free time. So if that time is even being wasted on like an advisor, like well, God, blah 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 blah. This should be like yeah, this is un un unconstitutional. He, this is like this is against the law like if it was i know this is like never going to happen but in a fair world this this is what secularism means to me you get to be religious on your free goddamn time not on taxpayer money but anyways um some interesting notes about this case wait shoot where did it go so um, the United Methodist Church has since defrocked the fallen pastor, though he continues to serve in a paid position at Windsor, where his wife now serves as lead pastor. Uh, 
Caldwell has was credited by the church, who noted that he voluntarily paid restitution to his victims before being sentenced, which the church said was virtually unheard of and extremely rare in these kinds of cases. So for just for um, clarity, um, he has denied the accusations, but he pled guilty last year. And he was in prison after pleading guilty. Now he's been formally sentenced to the six years. Um, so blah, 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 blah. then there are other um, uh, people involved with his Methodist group. Oh, Bishop, who is going to bat for him. Head of the Southeast Texas United Methodist Group, Bishop Scott Jones, noted that Caldwell, quote, confessed his crimes and offered a sincere expression of remorse for his actions and the harm they caused, as well as taking extraordinary steps towards repairing the damage. Um, Jones further mentioned the court heard about these efforts and made additional factors, including the significant uh, accomplishments over decades as a pastor and community leader when determining Mr. Caldwell's appropriate punishment for the confessed crimes. So here they're trying to... Um, yeah, so the, here's more status. of what Armin was saying. Like, so just because he did something good before as a pastor doesn't negate these crimes. In actuality, in my opinion... He's trading in this uh, ideology that being religious and being a pastor allows him to be in a position to advise people on a spiritual nature and should ostensibly follow the Ten Commandments if he's a Methodist and all these other things. So in my opinion, that actually makes his crime even more egregious because not just is he a criminal, but he's a hypocrite. Wait, Armin, can you... Um, there's a video that I actually want to play, like even just a few seconds of that's embedded in this article. Is Are you sharing audio? Yes. Okay. There's no music, so, right? Hello, church family. I'm Floyd hey, LeBlanc you, from. Pause and then um, full screen this real quick because I want to be people to see the full title. Um, the oh, wait. I need to do this, then do this. Hold on. Personnel committee here at Wednesday. Why is it not letting me? It's not letting me. Okay, okay, well, the full title of this video is just um, called It's Not Over Till It's Over, The Kingdom Building. Wait, where, why is it not showing well, I could just, the full title? I could just click on a video The here. Kingdom Building Continues. So this is uh, oh. very interesting. So just uh, play this really quick because they're trying to excuse this man. I'm Floyd LeBlanc from the Personnel Committee here at Windsor Village. Earlier today, the sentencing hearing was held in the Kirby John Caldwell court case in Shreveport, Louisiana. I'd like to share a few important points about the case. First, I believe Kirby John Caldwell was also a victim in this case. His victimization started when he chose the wrong business partners. He acknowledges this fact and he has accepted full responsibility. This business deal involving investment in Chinese heritage bonds resulted in financial harm to a group of investors, victims in the legal case. Mr. Caldwell has apologized and asked forgiveness from the people harmed in this matter. Those include the victims in the Shreveport legal case, his family, and the Windsor Village Church family, where he served as senior pastor for 38 years. Over the past 34 months, as this case has been pending, lay preacher Caldwell has remained very active with our church family, including during the pandemic, as we have engaged in virtual ministry and new initiatives, such as a food distribution partnership with the Houston Food Bank, delivering food weekly to families in Southwest Houston. Back to the bad business deal. Kirby John Caldwell and his wife were the first investors in the Chinese bonds, and thus the first victims. As a person seeking to operate in integrity, Wait, like Mr. Caldwell I like how you're just ha-ha reacting to people in the comments of this video. <laughs> you're the worst. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Um, no, it, it, it's just like my my mistake was trusting the wrong person. Come on. I was just thinking that exact thing. 
Right. Wait, that sounds like Yasmin Muhammad's apology. Uh that's why we were saying that i see oh, i see yeah. you're, i see you're picking up what i'm throwing down okay 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 okay, okay. we should go to the next news um you muted yourself it's okay it was just yes no 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 it's it, nobody got nobody died and nobody wow I almost said the R word. Oh my god, you Rifka would have been on me. I didn't, I didn't. Um <laughs> can nobody was R and nobody was K'd. So can no, I keep clap? This is draconian. Okay, okay. Next news, fine, whatever. Okay. Next oh no, I clapped after I said I wouldn't. Wow, wow. No clapping for draconian measures. Okay. Great. 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 Um, next news. So, <laughs> next news. Thai woman gets 43 years for sharing criticism of monarchy. In Thailand, accused of criticizing the royal family, authorities sentenced a Thai woman to 43 years in prison, the harshest sentence ever for insulting the monarchy in this country. The sentence could be seen as a warning shot to protesters demanding form in the kingdom, according to analysts. The former public servant, known only as Anchan, posted audio clips from a podcast on social media. The 63-year-old said she shared the audio files but never commented on the content. Thailand's uh, less majest laws forbids any insult to the monarchy and is among the world's strictest restrictions on free speech. Thailand resuscitated the controversial law last year after a three-year break in an effort to curb demonstrators from demanding changes to the monarchy with anti-government protests. According to her lawyer, a uh, Reuters news agency reported that Anchan pled guilty to 29 distinct violations to sharing and posting clips on YouTube and Facebook between 2014 and 2015. Guys, here's the deal. She didn't even comment on this content. She simply shared it. She was originally sentenced to 87 years. For sharing. Yes. And they reduced it to half since she pled guilty. Wow. Yes. It's um okay. It's really bad. So that's in the, insane. It's insane. Like um, there's no word to describe this. By yeah. the way, Thailand was a Buddhist country who literally think that their god, like their emperor, emperor, how do you say that? King. Is that he's a no, he's a is okay, yeah. He they think he's a god king. Like no, they literally think he's like a he, I, okay. I only recently it's like found a this divine out. monarchy yeah. kind of idea. No, which I only thought recently, went out a hundred years ago. Yeah, but I I I I was confused recently because is Thailand is a Buddhist country, and they think that their king is a Hindu god. So yeah, they are kind of connected. Um, Buddhist. And Hindus, their religions are connected in some weird ways, which we're not going to go into that. But that's, you know, you might think this is just political, but technically, because Thailand's king is a god, this is blasphemy law. Do you agree, guys, that this is yeah. blasphemy law? Yeah. Yeah. But Rivka, do you agree with that? Yeah. And I don't think blasphemies necessarily have to be restrictions on insulting deities or religions it can be a like a cultural blasphemy or a blasphemy against you know people they perceive are you sacrosanct um, no, yeah but by regard. definition blasphemy yeah but by definition i guess it's, it needs right. to be a deity or but the king yeah. is like is very sacrosanct in the same way yeah. that a lot of people feel that religion is and therefore if afforded some sort of special privileges of not being talked about or talked about negatively 
you know, and also this king, you know, gets to control what people say, even in, you know, a sh just by sharing something. There's this inference that even sharing something that might be potentially critical of the king is now of guilt you're guilty of you know by the association of you know yourself in that particular opinion okay so just to be clear for like what what thailand is saying like i know some people i know aj you don't you don't say that but um some people think like the monarchs in thailand are treated like a deity um they don't say they're like deities they literally think that like the claim is that this is an actual god like it's not like oh we treat him like a god we worship him like a god he is symbolically a god he is like i don't know like maybe god like there's some he has spiritually more powerful no he is a god a, a living god that is the actual that is not the and also to clarify this is not just a belief of some people in thailand this is the official position of thailand's government that their king is a living god a living hindu god okay this is how the level of insanity that we're dealing with here right now yeah um so some people are saying we need thailand blasphemous art okay guys no i want to go to thailand okay we'll do it i was thinking the same thing but we need to I go to thailand together so we can't do that yet yeah we can do that later okay fine <laughs> um to you to could just do cambodia vietnam or laos blasphemous art if you want <laughs> no in thailand they're very very aggressive if you insult buddha in any way as well so i don't know what's gonna happen i'm just being facetious like you know I country know. royalty yeah i know i know, I know. Um, all right so uh, no just to give you guys some more context um uh, authorities accused so uh, Anchan is among 14 people being prosecuted for uh les majest soon after 2014 when a military junta seized power vowing to stamp out criticism of the monarchy authorities accused the group of uploading podcasts common in dissent circles dissident circles which questioned official accounts of the monarchy the creator of the podcast was already released from jail after serving two years. So, um, like, the people who even created this podcast are out of jail. She didn't even comment on it. She just shared it. Um, for those who don't know, like, military juntas and coups are very common in Thailand. It's like our... <laughs> Um, this might not be a perfect comparison, but it's like an American election cycle. Like, it's very predictable. Um... And um, so, so there's been ongoing pro-democracy protests in Thailand because people are tired of this this the la lack of a system um, and just the constant political unrest. So um, protests, including limit uh, demands to limit the monarchy's powers, challenged the king's decision to declare crown wealth as his personal property, which made him the wealthiest person in Thailand. A national trust held those funds for the benefit of the people until now. And then there is also the king declaring um, personal command of military units based in Bangkok, which is an unprecedented act in modern Thailand. Um, and concentrated the military power within royal hands. Um, and so the king's move sent shockwaves throughout a country where people are indoctrinated from birth to revere and love the monarchy while fearing the consequences of denouncing it. Defining what constitutes an insult to Thailand's monarchy remains unclear. According to human rights group, the less majest law became a mere political tool to squash free speech and counter demands to reform. And the thing is, guys, that... The king doesn't even spend most of his time in Thailand. He's living in Germany most of the time. I believe he only recently returned to Thailand for the first time in years. Don't quote me on that. But he's not even in Thailand most of the time, and you still can't criticize him. His dog is a commander of the Air Force, and people go to jail for insulting his dog. Okay? So... 
Oh my God, you guys. <laughs> um, so I wanted to highlight this news for several reasons. One, this um, sentencing is draconian. Two, um, we're very pro-democracy. And I think the pr fight for democracy in Thailand is not highlighted enough in international media. Um, three, this is unequivocally a free expression issue. And we are obviously very passionate um, supporters of free expression. I'm a free speech absolutist. And um, this violates just about everything that I value. Um, so yeah, guys, keep an eye on Thailand. Um, should we move to the next news? Uh, yes. Can we Ooh, clap for the next news? Yes. Is it clap worthy? Okay, hold on. Yes. It's the Utah one, right? I've got those yes. correctly. All right. Utah is always usually fun. Juicy. All right. Next news. Next news. Utah Charter School linked to polygamous Mormons under investigation in the state of Utah of the United States of America. The West Valley City Public Charter School is under investigation by the Utah State Charter Board for its lack of diversity and spending irregularities. Fox 13 News reported that Vanguard Academy has ties to the King Kingston Group, a known polygamist sect of Mormonism in Utah. And not just any sect, guys, a notoriously fundamentalist child abusing sect cult um within the past five years vanguard academy has enrolled enrolled only one non-white student the school has also spent hundreds of thousands of taxpayer dollars on companies directly related to the kingston family according to public records the kingston group is one of utah's only hate groups declared such by the southern poverty law center in 2017 quote Vanguard has never, will never, use discrimination or bias to describe enrollment or single out our students on the basis of race, religion, family, surname, or any other association, said Suzanne Owen, the Vanguard Academy principal. Owen also commented that she was, quote, not familiar with the Kingston group. However, multiple past and present members of the Kingston group and family members say that Owen is one of the spiritual wives of Hiram Kingston. A former member of the group stated, it is well known that Suzanne is married to Hiram Kingston, who is the leader's brother. I think if Suzanne is going to lie about being f affiliated with the Kingston, then that just discredits everything else that she has said. So there are a lot of different um, issues that are going on here. Um, but I'll before I really dig into that, I want to get your guys's take. Can you can you give us a like a I, I it, this is a bit confusing. Can you give us a dumbed down version of what's going on? So um, so there are charter schools in America. They are, fall outside of public schooling, and um, but they use public funds. Um, so there are a couple things that are going on here. There are accusations of racist enrollment um not policies but behaviors okay because there is only one non-white student who was enrolled um then there is the accusations of their spending irregularities meaning that um you know uh schools have various services that they need to use um maybe it's it's building something maybe it's who they get materials provided from etc um this uh, Vanguard Academy has an unusual history of using basically every service is a group that is known to be a business owned by the Kingston group, meaning that they are using public funds to pump money into a fundamentalist cult, the businesses owned by a fundamentalist cult. Um, this woman is alleged to be a um, spiritual or secret wife of the leader's brother who is very powerful. So um, this family member said um, it's a spiritual wedding. So because they're not married on the books, there is no marriage certificate, you know, in, in the civil courthouse. Um, it's a spiritual wedding and it's just as good in God's eyes, said a former member of their group, Amanda Ray. It is so hard for me not to laugh. It is well known fact that Suzanne is married to Hiram Kingston, which is the leader's brother. 
And then, like I said, she says if she's going to lie about even being affiliated with the Kingstons, then it just discredits everything else that she has said. So people in the community are like, what are you talking about? You're not familiar with the Kingstons. You're married to like the second powerful most Kingston, <laughs> like second most powerful Kingston. So are um, they going to get in any legal trouble? Yes. So right. well, just a second, I'll get into that. So o Owen's defense was um, when talking about their spending irregularities and the, her familiarities with it. She said, no, like I said, this is a public charter school. We do business with whoever has the business that will fulfill our needs, whether they're aff affiliated with any kind of religion isn't part of the process. Um, and so uh, we are in a, the process of doing a thorough review of the school's procurement process and policies, stated uh, Stuart Okobia, this financial compliance manager for the Utah State Charter S School Board. So now they're in trouble with this board of the charter schools. When completed, we feel like we will be able to see if anything was violated or against the law or any broad board rules. Um, although members of the Utah State Charter uh, School Board did not comment on the investigation, they expressed the importance of diversity and inclusion in public schools. Um, and why don't we have a student body that more or less reflects that, plus or minus a certain percent, said one board member, Cynthia Phillips. So there's two issues here. There's accusations of racism, and then there's um, them not being above board on how they're spending their money. Or the fact that it's extremely suspicious that it is all going to businesses that are known to be owned by this fundamentalist cult. Um, for those who are not aware, um, Mormonism actually has, I don't know if it's a doctrine or just kind of um, a uh, cultural thing, but they have a, they have, there's a specific phrase that I can't remember right now about Mormons b basically bleeding the state dry um because they think that because they are god's chosen people they are entitled to take money from the state so they are known to use a lot of different loopholes policies um uh taking advantage of single mother support um to bleed the state dry because they think they deserve it because they are god's chosen people and i i could be getting some of the details of that wrong but i do know that that is a practice in some aspects some aspects of mormonism um and so because when i'm talking about the single mothers i'm talking about these women who are not legally married to these men they have Num just a lot of children with these men, but they are not legally married, so they can take advantage of state welfare support because they are legally single mothers. Um, so the state is then therefore funding these ginormous families. <laughs> um, but Rivka, what's your take on this? Oh yeah, um, I as far as what you were saying about um, there's one thing I thought of when you said how they spend their money. And I thought, well, no, how they spend the taxpayers money. You're right. So that's part of the alleged, you know, either violation or malfeasance or, you know, conflict of interest or whatever they're calling it. I don't think malfeasance is alleged, but um, that they're, you know, they're favoring this particular religious organization. And so it's a religious charter school getting public money and then funneling it back into another religious organization. So, yeah. you know, that is an issue. And then the idea that, um, so polygamy is illegal so they can't be married you know at the courthouse but they're still engaging in this these plural marriages which then they're justifying and you know apologizing for and you know so i just i find the whole idea of religious charter schools problematic to use a you know popular word because they are, are they paying taxes if they're religious organizations or is the taxpayer money going into religious organizations that aren't paying taxes either? Mm -hmm. All of this is very, you know, in my opinion, it's a convoluted sort of, you know, 
loophole, if you will, that somehow people get to take taxpayer dollars but don't replenish those taxpayer dollars to then further yeah. their, you know, dogmatic uh, indoctrination of children. So I would also like to note that, so the Kingstons are also known as the Latter-day Church of Christ as opposed to the Latter-day Church of, uh, uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints, which is the more mainstream um, Mormon church. Um, they broke from mainstream Mormon church because of the mainstream Mormon church um, started to distance itself and reject the doctrine of plural marriage or polygamous marriage. So they are defined by their practice of polygamy. Um, and they're just known for um, a plethora of abuses. Um, they're also known for um, uh, consanguinous relationships. That means marriages amongst a common ancestor. So like cousin marriages um, or uncle marriages, stuff like that. Um, and if you just Google like uh, Kingston Group Utah, some of the first thing that some of the first things that came up on my browser was polygamous Kingston Group may have swiped millions in student aid lawsuit says, and also feds moved to seize the homes and businesses from polygamous Kingston Group as fraud defendants plead guilty. Okay, so they are, and this this is from years ago. They are well documented in participating in. Um, widespread fraudulent conspiracy um so this is a huge problem and uh it's it's i'm really i'm glad that the board is investigating this i just want i forgot to add one thing too now i don't know whether these charges of racism are true or not you know maybe there just isn't a diverse population of which they're drawing from you know who knows but it is concerning considering the Mormon church itself history of racism and not allowing uh, black people to be deacons in the church or elders and or even being, you know, coming Mormon until the 70s, I think it was. Now, don't quote me on that, but there's a history of exclusion and, and discrimination against black people in the Mormon church. You know, the whole tribes of ham. Oh, yeah. They're extremely anti-black. So the fact that this might be something that you would see in a fundamentalist sect isn't necessarily surprising. Although, you know, we don't know that hasn't been proven or not. I don't know. But, you know, you can follow a money trail easier than you know it might take more investigation to figure out whether people are deliberately discriminating against people yeah um i completely agree and um hopefully there will be consequences for this um so should we move on to the next news yes can we clap for the next news um <clears throat> Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to do it. Next, wait. Next news. Next news. Um, Indian Muslim comedian uh, Munawar Faruqi jailed despite no evidence of blasphemy. Munawar Faruqi was detained following a complaint by members of a right wing vigilante group in India. He was denied bail twice, despite officials saying that they had no video evidence of him, quote unquote, insulting Hindu deities. On January 1st, 2021, police arrested Faruqi and four others at Monroe's Cafe, which uh, in India's central city of Indore, where the comedians planned to perform. Um, some critics say that Indian comedian Munawar Faruqi is an, uh, a, his arrest is an attack on freedom of speech. As he continues confinement without bail, the well-known comedian now awaits his fate in two states after being arrested for allegedly insulting Hindu deities. Each investigation potentially carries a four-year prison term. But no evidence exists to justify the arrest. On January 13th, Officer 
Khatri denied that police had such video proof against Faruqi, but he defended Faruqi's arrest. Khatri praised the Hindu vigilantes for being, quote, active and alert. He added, quote, it didn't really matter, end quote, if Faruqi was innocent of the allegations. A video surfaced of Faruqi's performance in April 2020. Officer Khatri said the video, where the comedian found humor in a popular Hindi song, also proves Faruqi's intent in the 2021 case. Quote, they were going to do it anyway, he added. So this is insane. Um, <laughs> the police are openly admitting that they do not have evidence against this comedian, but because he once made a joke about a popular Hindi song that proves that he intended to blaspheme against Hindu goddesses on the 1st of January. Okay? Wow. So this is how this is how far the hurt sentiments are going. Okay? It's insane. Before okay, um to my knowledge, um a popular Hindi song is is not um it's that's that's not protected under the law in India. Okay? So I, I mean, India does have blasphemy laws. If anyone says differently, they don't know what the fuck they're talking about. Okay. But those blasphemy laws are specifically regarding religious communities. Don't say they, the F word. Um, YouTube will punish us. I'm feeling passionately about this. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, a popular song has nothing to do with religious sentiments. So this is how far, like, their control is going that they feel that because he joked about a popular Hindi song that this now means that he was going to blaspheme against Hindu goddesses. A lot of other people are talking about how motivation about this is likely because he's a Muslim. Okay, so there's a, an element of anti-Muslim bigotry that's going on here as well. Um, because even the implication that a Muslim might even have the potential of making a joke about their goddesses is apparently worthy of him being uh, in jail and denied bail twice for something he didn't even do that the police openly admit that they had no evidence of him doing. And they praise vigilante groups for beating the crap out of him as they were taking him away to the police station. Um, and the police is even saying it doesn't matter. The police said it doesn't matter if he's innocent of the allegations. To give you guys some more context, um, the state of Uttar Pradesh is now trying to extradite him to Uttar Pradesh so that they can punish him even more harshly. Uttar Pradesh, which is probably the most um, vitriolically bigoted state against muslims in india now one um, so he's he's facing charges in two states where this where this crime that didn't happen they're trying to punish him in a state that it, it this it, it where it didn't even happen yeah oh india you, uh, if you is india like it's your fault if you're gonna be look treated like a joke you're becoming a joke you're becoming a ridiculous country your entire country is becoming a joke and it's only your fault your government's fault okay and anybody who elected the bjp let me finish let me finish this rifka i do want to mention to darwinian atheists saying hashtag old news this is something that is so annoying and you should be ashamed of like point hashtag old news there was an update to the story Okay, he was arrested on January 1st, and now there is an update to the story. That's why this is being highlighted. Is you know, you have such bad takes sometimes, Urban and Atheists in Live Chat. Like maybe, maybe just because you don't know there's an update to the story, maybe don't assume that this is old news just because you are not up to date yourself. Uh, but Rifka, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I wanted to say that so now this becomes even more draconian and even more controlling because you don't even have to be directly insulting or supposedly insulting the religion itself or a person or a deity, anything 
that is Hindu related. So the potentially the food, the language, a song, you know, all of these things that might be adjacent to Hinduism are now protected. So it becomes that it's this thing that no one is allowed to comment on at all in any way. Anything well, remotely associated with it. But it's not even specifically no one is allowed to comment. I mean, maybe this is me being the Indian version of woke here. Right, but, but particularly think, think Muslims Muslim. aren't, especially Muslims aren't allowed to comment on anything. Yeah. And that's who it's directed at. It's so, you know, hope that, you know, people will start to self center because they're anything now can be, particularly if you have police praising mobs, saying that they don't even need evidence, you know, just, you know, I feel it or I think that he might be doing that is enough kind of idea. Or he's yeah. Muslim is enough. Yeah. So and he must is, be. The thing is that, um, so despite Khatri's admissions about the thin to non-existent evidence linking the accused to the crime, all six continue to be in judicial custody. Okay, I want to highlight one thing. They're being very clear here. If he did make this joke, that is a crime. Okay, this is how ridiculous this is. On January 13th, they extended judicial custody by two more weeks. So the, <laughs> they're still in jail for this um it's uh, like they're looking for the they're holding him and then they're going to go back and see if they can manufacture some sort of evidence for yeah, a non-existent crime the the court charged the six accused under sections uh 295a and a number of other sections of the indian penal code for quote deliberately intending to outrage religious feelings for uttering words etc with deliberate intent to wound religious feelings and for acts done by several persons for the furtherance of common intention so it like i said it is very clear that this is for a religious purpose even though even his making a joke about a Hindi song is not religious, it's not covered under that penal code, but that showed his intent to do so in this case. It's crazy. Um, uh, so, uh, Gatari Singh, a senior counsel at the Bombay High Court, said that the judge had gone beyond the framework of the law. Singh said that the police report did not contain any specific remarks that Faruqi or others had allegedly made against Hindu religious sentiment. Quote, the police should have stated out the exact words used by the accused, what the intention was, and the harm or injury caused by the words, said Singh. Singh said that bail should be grant that the uh, bail should have been granted to all of the accused. Bail is a right as a right is a rule and not an exception. She said, "You cannot arbitrarily decide whether you want to grant it or not. It is only in exceptional circumstances that bail can be refused." So uh, there is obvious, um, uh, just corruption of the standard pr procedure that is um, a, a, the standard of the law. In, in, in the case of the accused. Um, oh, Katie is saying, with this crap, Indians still made hashtag India wants blasphemy law trending on Twitter uh, yesterday. at Trending all the way at number four for FC. Wow. wow. So this is not, by the way, so if you thought that this is just the government being dumb, it's not. This is actually... This crap is backed up by popular demand. And it drives me crazy because people want to say, I mean, technically this is accurate that India's um, blasphemy law was established because of um, Muslim outrage and violence that happened because of a specific book, right? That did happen. But clearly, if it is trending at number four in India, you can't use that excuse and say that this is all the Muslims' fault, okay? There's a substantial portion of the population that wants to maintain this draconian restriction on free expression hmm. um i do want to read this uh, chris I, I agree with you but i do want to um clarify something saying popular populism is always a uh, is, is always dangerous no matter which political affiliation the source unfortunately da, 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 we in the u.s were lucky uh trump was so inept uh, it was closer than i am comfortable with though 
I agree with you, but the thing is that it's not just that in India it's a lot worse, not just because the BJP is a lot more effective than Trump, but also because the demand for far right populism is astronomically higher in India. Like all the problems that you think you have with the far right in the United States is legitimate and it's a concern, but it's not even like on a global scale, if you're worried about the far right, you need to be worried about India. The rise of the far right is mostly happening in India, India. more than any in, more than anywhere else on the planet. It and is he's scary. Not exaggerating. That is a fact. The BJP is the world's largest political party. Hmm. And the world's largest political party is a far right party. It is also the world's most well funded party. Anybody that is um, anti um, far right, anybody that is for secularism, um, they need to pay attention to India because these values are being threatened in India more than most places. The only other place that could compete with the violation of human rights uh, at the degree that it's happening in India, it's China. But it's basically, yeah. But yeah, so this is this is insane. Um, yeah, all right, let's, we should actually uh, maybe highlight this if, if this is actually real, if um, that became, trending in, in in India demanding for blasphemy laws we should like that should be its own news yeah because here we have this dumb Hindu apologetics again and yeah Muslims want the law there's no concept of blasphemy in Hindu theology whether or not that You're is an true, idiot which I highly mm. I'm highly skeptical about this claim whether or not that's true it is clearly there is popular and massive demand for it right so stop pointing um, the finger uh, no, but can you highlight that again? Uh, first of all, um, you're an idiot. Second of all, uh, it doesn't. Muslims, you speak as of Muslims as if they all want the same thing. Uh, Muslims are very different from each other. Um, and even if, even if all Muslims wanted uh, blasphemy law, that doesn't mean that it justifies you idiots wanting the blasphemy law. Uh, but and by you, I don't mean Hindus. I mean you, as in people like you, Shabham. Um, even if every single Muslim wanted the blasphemy law, which is definitely not true, you're still an idiot for demand for for supporting a government that is bringing blasphemy laws. So um, another thing I want to say: first of all, blasphemy does exist in Hindu theology. Uh, we have seen, we have reviewed the scripture. Here, live on Atheist Republic, blasphemy is a concept in Hindu theology. Um, but however, if it wasn't a concept in Hindu theology, uh, it is now a concept in Hindu theology. You guys have made it not only a concept in uh, Hindu theology, you have made it a law. You have made Hindu-based law. So it's not only a concept in Hindu theology, it's an enforced concept by the world's largest political party. Uh, in Hindu theology and the fact that theology has anything to do with how your government rules is already barbaric uh, backwards and you should be ashamed for supporting this level of uh, backwardness and anti-progress in your country and India will be a much better country uh, without people like you Shabham. Anyways, oh, well, Susanna. to be fair, I mean Shabham is telling you to go F yourself right now but he is clarifying that he doesn't actually want the blasphemy law. Yeah, but no, no, no. Yeah, but still, but you're giving you are denying. really dumb explanations for it. Yeah, okay. So <laughs> here's the thing. Um, sure, you corrected me. You don't want blasphemy laws, but fuck you right back. Oh. Or even, <laughs> yeah, for, for coming up with the dumbass excuses for blasphemy law, even though you don't want blasphemy laws. Like you're doing whataboutism, right? So you're doing what about them? Like, oh, the Muslims want it, as if they are deserving it. Here's here's how it works, by the way. So you're like people say, oh yeah, blas uh, blasphemy law is not good, or this is not good, but Muslims want it the same. So you you are excusing bad shit happening to them. This actually this is very interesting because this happens, for example, in Pakistan, right? Pa a lot of people are against uh, blasphemy laws in Pakistan, but now that Shias 
are being the victims of blasphemy laws. Even the people who are against blasphemy laws, they're like, yeah, I'm against blasphemy laws. But by the way, let me highlight the fact that the Shias are responsible for uniting with Sunnis at some point in bringing blasphemy laws yeah, against, uh, Ahmadis. against Ahmadis. So now they're saying like, yeah, I'm against blasphemy laws. But let me also keep reminding you that, you know, I'm kind of suggesting that Shias deserve this as if treating them all as a collective the same way Chopin is treating all Muslims like a collective, okay? Like he says Muslims as if it's instead of some Muslims, many Muslims and suggesting, I know you might deny that you're suggesting that, by the way, Chopin, you are actually for blasphemy laws. Let me clarify that. You are oh. blasphemy. You are for blasphemy laws because you are suggesting that they deserve this the same way that people who are keep highlighting as if Shias as a collective as a whole are responsible for blasphemy laws in the in Pakistan. That's a suggestion that they deserve what's coming at them. Like they are, they earned this. This is karma coming right back at them, right? So you are actually technically for blasphemy laws, and fuck you right back, Shabham. Um, anyways, well, on that note. <laughs> <laughs> oh look at the <laughs> no look yeah. look oh you're moving to something else uh this is how oh, hindus are getting killed for insulting for islam okay great so i basically this is me saying you shop i'm saying i have nothing to say i'm completely defeated and i'm humiliated by what you pointed out so i'm just going to move on to something else that is completely a different topic because as i have nothing something to, else that as, as if we wouldn't completely condemn that is also barbaric and insane. yeah as if like yeah oh yeah like as if i am oh, that, yeah no, no we're, we're cool with this <laughs> Yeah, I think we're cool with this. Yes. So this is you. You. This is you admitting that you have nothing to say and you're full of shit. Um, all right. So we don't have anything to show. I, I love. I love. I love this comment about how we don't know crap about India because um, I know the Indian Penal Code better than like many indians so <laughs> actually I i'm gonna claim something else actually it seems based on shopham's comment we know more about india than shopham so that's oh. sure. <laughs> yeah <laughs> all right we should go to the next news but i don't have anything to show for the next news right there's no link or anything no i mean we could we could show our suspended accounts okay you could do you want to show that i don't have any links um yeah i don't know what happened to rivka she just disappeared so i think her internet just cut yeah, she, out i think she has connection issues because that doesn't usually happen um but let's do this one fast because i'm supposed to be on a call i know i know i know um so guys um if you are not familiar um i got um suspended on twitter last week okay for no reason i was not given any email notice from twitter because usually if you um, are, uh, even if there's a report filed against you, sometimes you receive an email and they will give you an, an explanation as to why. So I did not receive any of the customary emails saying that this is specific tweets that you, that are against terms of service. No email detailing any wider policy that I violated whatsoever. I have received no notice from Twitter about why my account was suspended. I have good uh, news for Hindus. Oh, and one particular Hindu in uh, in specific. Um, I have good reason to believe that it is very. It is likely that um, my account was suspended for. Um, uh, I don't even think I. Do, I don't even. I did not often directly blaspheme Hindu goddesses. I was maybe just talking about blasphemy in general. Maybe. Um, retweeting it and stuff i uh regardless it, i have heavy reason to believe that it is because of my support for blas blaspheming hindu goddesses in general um so <laughs> marcia is saying susanna you have arrived <laughs> um, However, this is extremely frustrating because i if you don't even receive that email i can't i have to just send a blind appeal Right? I can't even reference a specific case or give make my case to Twitter about any um, how they wrongfully assumed that I violated their policies um, because just I was going to send a tweet and then all of a sudden I couldn't because it just said I was suspended. So Armin was suspended um, a few months ago 
And we also believe that he was um, a wrongful suspension, that he did not. They actually gave him a reason, though, that it was for hateful conduct. Um, I don't believe that any of his tweets actually meet the standard of hateful conduct as defined by their own terms of service. Um, and so we have devised a strategy plan. Oh, Edgar Payne is saying temporary suspension, Susanna. If that was the case, they would have notified me. I no, still it's very interesting because I got first three, like I got three temporary suspensions every time telling me that I'm saying something hateful, even post, even though it was literally just blasphemous arts without any, you know, some, some of them without any commentary. Uh, it was just the art of Hindu goddesses that wasn't even nude. Um, I, I got messages for, and then eventually I got fully suspended and I got emails about it. I got words about it. Susanna was just like, no Go email, on. no warning and a full permanent suspension um right after this is the and so what's your theory um that a certain butthurt attorney um he he claims responsibility for getting me suspended um Yes, so uh, those who have been following our situation for a while, there is an Indian attorney who has... Um, Do you want to show or share your screen? Uh, not at the moment, because I don't want there to even be the accusation of me inciting harassment against this person, um, who has mm. filed a uh, motion, or no, public interest litigation in the Supreme Court of India that does not name us as a necessary party, but it does explicitly mention Armin's blasphemy as a reason why the government of India should hold social media companies directly liable for the content hosted on their platforms and that the government should establish expert officers who monitor hate speech and fake news. Um, so that's, you know, not authoritarian at all. Um, he also filed a civil suit involving uh, Armin's blasphemy, uh, although there have been some developments in that civil suit, that lawsuit. Um, yeah, so this person is after us, and I have reason to believe that he is involved. Um, but should we talk about our strategy in this, or what do you? Have Before to you do that, I, I'm not saying I'm not I'm not saying you should share anything or not. I'm just gonna comment like I'm not. You don't need to say like yeah, okay, but I'm not still not doing it. It's fine, but I'm just going to say I think you're being way too careful. Uh, there's no way just highlighting a public tweet about somebody, a lawyer doing something or something that they made public. There's no way that could be seen by any court or any laws, harassment. Um, just us highlighting like, oh, look, this is what this lawyer is saying about us. To If you're getting anybody telling you that that could be seen as harassment, I don't. I think they're being way too cautious even from then when then we need to be if we want to move forward with this but yeah okay well let me find it wait just a sec luke is saying armin can give you a tour of twitter jail he knows it well yes <laughs> this is what i was saying to armin i was like i wasn't expecting to be cellmates with you this quickly <laughs> like i am she guys and i'm i am so good i am so good about twitter's terms of service because i don't want to deal with the stress the constant stress of getting our accounts back that i have to deal with consistently since september it's stressful it's not fun okay. it takes up a lot of my time this is I'm this I'm in a call. i know sorry so um yes i was supposed to free armin from twitter jail instead i ended up as a cellmate next to him <laughs> <laughs> um so uh there is okay i'll just screw it i'll just show it um so here you see wait okay let me uh, a tweet by this this individual saying this is a lawyer yes that skeptic Susanna who posted a derogatory <clears throat> post on Hindu gods and goddesses now her Twitter account is also suspended after my complaints so he's tagging he's claiming responsibility and then he tags um, several uh, likely BJP IT cells and then here's the incriminating evidence um so here's like a screenshot because when you report someone and if you're successful in your report then you get they tell you you know and think an update on your report uh our investigation found this account violated the twitter rules okay what's to be fair i do not know if this is genuine like maybe this is doctored i don't really think so but what's important here is that there is nothing it doesn't specify which rules 
I've reported a lot of people on Twitter. Well, not a lot. I've reported a fair amount of people on Twitter before. Every time I've, my report has been successful, it details the specific rule that they violated. Usually it was for releasing personal information or targeted harassment, right? And so they would specify this here. This Even this does not specify what I violated. All right, let's move on to what you're going to do because I really need to be on this call. Whoops. Yes. So um, I we are going to take Twitter to the Better Business Bureau. Um, do people know what the Better Business Bureau is? Let me find out. Like, Okay, let's just like let's do uh, like only one more minute of explaining this because I have to go. So the Better Business Bureau is um it, it 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 it's it's a nonprofit organization, but it also it's involved in establishing marketplace trust. And um, your score that you get at the best, Better Business Bureau is very important in America, and can have consequences. So you can file a complaint with the BBB, and um, this will affect the score of a company. And this is very serious. So a lot of people have recommended that this is a way for me to get my account back. So this is the action that I'm taking. And if this is not successful, I'm going to take them to the Federal Trade Commission. Wow. Yeah. And even if this doesn't succeed in anything, at least we could use it as a way to see um, if we could, you know, if it works or not, right? Like, uh, even if there, we will... Um, a lot of people say, oh, it will work, it won't work. We have to try. We have to try everything we can do, right? Um, but, yeah, so we will keep you updated on the progress in this. So we're going to keep escalating it and see how far we can escalate it. I mean, they managed to escalate our case all the way to the Supreme Court of India. Um, we just we might as well start escalating back. Like, we instead of just taking this line back, we want to, you know, fight back instead of just accepting what's happening right so we'll keep you updated on how this goes anyways i have to go you guys have been awesome uh, thank you susanna and thank you to rivka and guys our blasphemous art the safe for work no no nude no nudity version of our blasphemous art is available for free right now uh, so link in the description there's a e free ebook that you could get when you subscribe to our newsletter a link in the description and uh, the nude version is only available to our patrons but then we thought like people should be able to get our blasphemous art um even if they're not patrons so be a newsletter subscriber and you get the free version link in the description okay cool 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 yeah get it it's hydra it's derma Subscribe, uh, subscribe, subscribe subscribe to everything atheist republic my personal youtube channel follow us on twitch everything all right <laughs> bye Bye.